That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Earlier this week, Rishi Sunak announced a £4.2 billion contract to build five Type 26 frigates on the Clyde. This is a decision that will protect and strengthen our Scottish shipbuilding industry. Yeah. Uh, the UK Government contract will support 1,700 jobs at Govan and Scotston alone, with a further 2,300 jobs in the wider supply chain. So will the First Minister join me in wholeheartedly welcoming this huge investment in Scottish jobs and our economy by the UK Government? Yeah. First Minister. Well, yes, I, I, I do welcome this announcement and I welcome the recognition of the skills and the talent and the expertise on the River Clyde. Um, of course, while these are responsibilities that continue to lie in the hands of the UK Government, uh, albeit with Scottish taxpayers contributing to the cost of them, then it is absolutely vital that Scotland benefits fully. Uh, so, yes, I do welcome the decision. I would also take the opportunity to congratulate BAE. Uh, I've campaigned uh, over many years for the future of Govan Shipyard, which used to be in my constituency, is now in the constituency of Hamza Yusuf. Uh, but while I do, of course, uh, welcome the award of this contract, uh, I'm duty-bound to note that the original proposal uh, back in 2010 uh, was not for five uh, new vessels, it was actually for 13 uh, new vessels. And it was said then that all of that work uh, would be undertaken on the Clyde. Uh, so let, yes, let's welcome it, but let's not uh, rewrite history in the process. Douglas Ross. Well, I'll, I'll take that as being about as good as it gets for the First Minister supporting decisions by the UK Government, because this is a massive boost to Scottish shipbuilding and is only possible because we are part of the United Kingdom. Uh, well, well, they don't like it, but an investment of this scale in engineering and manufacturing jobs would not be possible if the SNP got their way. If the Nationalists ever managed to separate Scotland from the rest of the United Kingdom, these Royal Navy ships would almost certainly be built elsewhere and the highly skilled Scottish jobs lost. And don't just take our word for it. Earlier this week, we heard from Keith Hartley, a professor of economics and a defence expert. He's advised the United Nations, the European Commission and the European Defence Agency. He said, and I quote, I don't see a future for a Scottish warship building industry in an independent Scotland. Yeah. First Minister, he's right, isn't he? First Minister. Before I go into the detail of that, let me just make the general point that I've made in this chamber before. Uh, if Douglas Ross wants to have a debate um, about the benefits, uh, or as he would see it otherwise, uh, of independence, then I really welcome that. Let's have that debate, and then let's the, let the people of Scotland decide the outcome in a referendum. And if Douglas Ross was really confident in his arguments, then he'd have the courage to have this debate, not just in the safety of the parliamentary debating chamber, but out there in towns and villages and communities all over Scotland. Now, I do believe that the expertise and the skills of our shipbuilders on the River Clyde uh, are world class. Uh, and I believe they would compete successfully for work uh, across the world, uh, regardless of the constitutional future of Scotland. That's the confidence I have in our shipbuilding industry. Of course, an independent... And, and uh, before Douglas Ross uh, tries to argue against that, of course, uh, some of the work that was announced uh, this week for Howland and Wolfe, for example, uh, the UK government at one point intended to hand all of that overseas and compete the contract internationally. Uh, so the point is kind of made uh, on on that matter. But of course, an independent Scotland, like independent countries all over the world, and an independent Scotland as a full member of NATO would have naval capabilities of its own, capabilities that can and would be served and improved upon by our world-renowned shipbuilding industry and expertise. Uh, the difference between me and Douglas Ross is I have confidence yep. in our industry in all circumstances. He clearly doesn't. <laughs> 
Douglas Ross. So, who should the public trust on the economics of shipbuilding? A First Minister who can't build a single ferry for £250 million or a defence expert who's advised the United Nations? Of course, the First Minister has to deny the facts because the independence movement is sinking. It's absolutely <laughs> sinking. She is up Separation Creek without a paddle. And we know that there wouldn't be any major ships built if she got her way. Because look at her, her own appalling record on failing to build essential ferries for Scotland's island communities. The UK government has delivered seven ships here in Scotland during her time as First Minister. Over the same period, how many have the SNP Scottish Government delivered? First Minister. Well, Douglas Ross regularly, and uh, let me say rightly, challenges me on the delay to the delivery of the ferries. But he should perhaps be careful what uh, he wishes for in terms of the exchange we're having today because, of course, the vessels uh, that he is lauding today, and I have welcomed uh, the announcements around, uh, back in 2013, the UK government said that the first of these vessels would come into service around 2020. Earlier this month, it was reported that the first Type 26 wouldn't come into service until October 2028, oh. eight years after the proposed date. Members, so there we go on. Members, there we go on timescale. Members, let, let's hear one another, please. Yeah. Let's Thank turn. You. Let's turn to cost because the defence secretary, uh, Ben Wallace, has also said this in cost that over the lifetime of the programme, uh, the cost would be 233 million more than forecast. So perhaps uh, Douglas Ross should turn some of these questions to his colleagues south of the border if he wants to come here and make a big issue of these things in this chamber. But two final points, presiding officer. Uh, firstly, firstly, if Douglas Ross, I've just answered the question. He asked me about delays and costs. Thank and I you. think I've just answered his question pretty fully. Uh, but two final points, presiding officer. If Douglas Ross really believed what he has just said about Scotland's independence movement, he would be desperate for an independence yeah. referendum. The fact that he running is running scared. scared of an independence referendum, I think, proves him wrong. And secondly, presiding officer, while I do uh, welcome these announcements for the Clyde this week, the fact is that most people across Scotland uh, right now, and indeed the UK, who are watching television, uh, will be watching the Chancellor on his feet in the House of Commons announce significant, deep, real terms cuts and tax rises. Uh, that's the price of Tory government. And that's why an increasing number of people in Scotland want this country to be independent. <laughs> Douglas Ross. Anyone watching the Chancellor's... Thank you. Anyone watching the Chancellor's autumn statement will look at what that is delivering, rather than the narrative from the, from the fibbing First Minister who has been caught out so many times, because the narrative from the Chancellor today is a UK government that is increasing benefits and pensions in line with inflation, that is increasing spending on health and on education, that is delivering £1.5 billion of extra support to Scotland and is investing in the future of our economy. Uh, and the First Minister had a very, very long narrative, but zero answers. That's what I'm desperate for in here, is finally an answer from Nicola Sturgeon. But the reason she didn't answer is because her government, in the same time that the UK government has delivered seven warships, has delivered one ferry. Oh. Seven warships compared to one ferry. And now the UK government will build another five frigates here in Scotland, but we don't know when the SNP will actually deliver and complete a ferry. Their failure is having a real impact on people and the livelihoods right across Scotland. Almost, yes, really, Cabinet Secretary. Members. Yes, Cabinet Secretary. Because almost half Members, of all Members, excuse me.
I am simply not having members shouting at one another across the aisles. Can we please hear one another when we are speaking? The, the Cabinet Secretary is not just shouting at me. She is shouting at the island communities who are crying out for support from this First Minister and this Government. Because before I was interrupted by the Cabinet Secretary, I was going to say half, half of Highlands and Islands businesses said that ferry cancellations are posing a risk to their future. Yeah. And just this week, we've heard from Islanders who are again enduring food shortages. The First Minister might not want to admit that her shipbuilding record has sunk the case for independence, but will she at least accept that her government's failure to replace lifeline ferries is doing massive damage to our island communities? First Minister. Uh, yes, I have said on many occasions that the impact on our island communities of the delays to the ferries is deeply regrettable, which is why the government uh, with Ferguson Shipyard is focused so much and so hard on delivering uh, these ferries. But Douglas Ross comes here um, and lauds uh, five uh, Type 26 frigates, and you know, he is uh, right to do so. I've welcomed that announcement, but tries to make a comparison with ferries. I think he probably, before doing so, should have reflected on the fact that the first of these Type 26 vessels will come into service eight years after it was planned to do so and at a significant cost overrun. So if he wants to trade these things, then he should at least understand the facts uh, that he's basing his argument uh, on. Um, and secondly, presiding officer, you know, I've already uh, talked about the impact on our island communities and I, I repeat that. But what is having a significant impact on the lives and the livelihoods of people across Scotland is what the Chancellor of the Exchequer is currently setting out in the House of Commons. If Douglas Ross wants to talk about interruption to food supplies, for example, across the whole of the UK caused by Brexit, yeah. then perhaps we might focus Absolutely. on that. Or the £55 billion black hole uh, at the heart of UK finances, largely caused by a combination of Brexit and Tory economic mismanagement that the Chancellor has just said has been filled uh, by tax rises and spending cuts, more than half of it by spending cuts. So budgets for this government set at a time when inflation was 3%, now being eroded by inflation at more than 10%. That is having a devastating impact on people, on businesses, on public services across our country. And when Briefly, we consider all of that, presiding officer, it is no wonder at all that Douglas Ross did not want to come to this chamber and talk about any of the harm the Conservatives are doing to people across Scotland. Uh, before I move on to question two, I would prefer if members would please avoid language that suggests that other members are being deliberately untruthful. And I call Anna Sarwar. This week, the British Medical Association in Scotland sounded an alarm about the state of GP practices across the country. They say that practices are struggling with vacancies and GPs are, in their words, exhausted, burnt out and cannot see the light at the end of the tunnel. First Minister, people across the country are sick of phone lines ringing out when they call their GP first thing in the morning. Do you agree with BME Scotland and accept their criticism that this government is not doing enough to tackle the GP crisis? First Minister. Uh, let me come on uh, centrally in a second to what we are doing uh, to tackle the situation with GP services in particular. But yes, I do accept what the BME say about the pressure on our GPs. The NHS as a whole is under very significant pressure, greater pressure perhaps than at any time in the history of the National Health Service. That is true for those who work in our acute sector eh, and it is also true of those who work in primary care, um, including GPs. So I absolutely eh, accept eh, those comments of the BME. Eh, that, of course, is exactly why, starting from a base where we already have proportionately higher staffing in the NHS in Scotland than other parts of the UK and proportionately higher funding for our NHS, we have a, a target of recruiting over eh, the next few years 800 eh, additional GPs in headcount terms. So far, uh, since 2017, we have recruited 277 of them. In addition to that, we are supporting the wider primary care teams. So, uh, since uh, 
in, in recent times, we have recruited over 3,000 uh, primary care multidisciplinary team members uh, to help with the pressure on GPs. Uh, NHS Pharmacy First has provided almost 3 million consultations uh, across its network. Uh, so we continue to take action to support GPs, but to support the wider teams in which GPs operate. And it's right and proper that we do so. Anna Sarwar. Uh, the First Minister says that more GPs are being recruited, and she says she's listening to what the BME has to say about the pressures they face but she's clearly not listening to what they have to say about the recruitment crisis that we have in this National Health Service that predates the pandemic. Uh, she talks about the 227 new GPs recruited. The BMA is saying that we are 1,000 GPs short right now. That means unbearable pressure on existing GPs, and it means many patients unable to access a GP. And on the First Minister's target of 800, we are well short, and the BMA have made it clear that missing the target would mean, and I quote again, disastrous for Scotland and our patients. And at the same time, the First Minister has decided to cut the budget for primary care by £65 million. These cuts mean taking away the ability to recruit the health professionals that GP practices need to support their patients. Dr Buist has this to say. This cut threatens to undermine practices at the exact moment when we should be doing the opposite. So will the First Minister reverse this cut, truly listen to the BMA, and also support Scotland's NHS staff? First Minister. So, look, these are important issues. Let me take the budgetary one uh, first. I don't like uh, the budget situation that the Scottish Government faces, uh, but the hard reality is that this year our budget has been eroded to the tune of £1.7 billion because of inflation. It is effectively a fixed budget. We have no levers to increase the revenue available to us within uh, this financial year. So we have to make very difficult decisions. Uh, we have been open with the Chamber about those decisions. And if any member of the Chamber uh, thinks that we should take different decisions, they can come and put that case uh, to us. Uh, what they can't do is magic up more money uh, for this financial year. Uh, that's a reality uh, that Anna Sarwar's colleagues in Wales uh, openly recognise. Uh, they are facing tough decisions as well, um, and they are making clear uh, that without additional funding from the UK government, then uh, those tough decisions are inescapable. So that is the reality we face. None of us like it, uh, but we cannot escape it. In terms of uh, GPs, we have uh, more GPs per head of population than other parts of the UK, but we want to grow our GP workforce, which is why the target I have spoken about um, and the progress against that target is so important. But so too is the redesign and reform work we are doing in terms of the wider primary care teams. None of these things are easy, um, and the impact on patients of the pressure on our NHS, I think all of us uh, acutely understand. Uh, but we will continue to support those who work in our National Health Service. Uh, of course, we'll try to uh, recruit from overseas as much as we can as well, something that inexplicably Labour seems to have set their face against. So we'll continue to take the steps to support our NHS in these uh, tough times, because that is what they deserve and what the people of Scotland expect from us. Anna Sarwar. The, the First Minister wants to pretend that she's not been in government for 15 years and been in charge of setting the budget uh, for the NHS for 15 years. Yeah, these, problems, these problems predate the budget and the inflation crisis, but I recognise the inflation crisis, and that's why when the Deputy First Minister came to this chamber two months ago with the emergency statement, we said then that we would work constructively with the government if they opened up the books. They have failed to open up the books, rather hiding and playing politics rather than doing right by the people across this country. But these decisions have consequences. Now, the Deputy First Minister called the uh, cut of £65 million for GP practices, which are already uh, short-staffed under pressure, as a reprioritisation. Let's call it what it is. It's a cut that's having a devastating consequence uh, for staff and for patients. And at the same time as cutting GP practices, the Health Secretary tells people to go to their GP instead of going to the A&E. Another case of the SNP telling NHS staff to do more with less, leaving patients waiting longer to be seen, longer to be diagnosed and longer to be treated. The SNP has been in charge of our NHS for 15 years and there's been a crisis in every part of it. In our GP practices, at our accident emergencies, in our hospitals, staff are crying out for help. Patients are dying. Does the First Minister accept this is the worst it's ever been? All happening on Nicola Sturgeon and Hamza Yusuf's watch. First Minister. 
Nothing I have said today or at any time takes away from the fact uh, that management of the NHS is the responsibility of me and my government. I uh, absolutely accept that and take that responsibility seriously. Is the pressure on the NHS uh, greater than it has been, uh, I think I said this myself earlier on, uh, at any time in the history of the NHS? Yes, it is. Uh, that has been significantly exacerbated by the pandemic, but there are other factors at play there as well, the changing demographics uh, of our population populations, for example. So these are significant challenges uh, that governments have to work uh, through. Uh, the fact of the matter is, though, uh, that while management of the NHS is our responsibility, uh, the amount that we are able to invest in the National Health Service uh, is determined uh, by funding decisions that are taken at Westminster, the kind of funding decisions that are being set out in the House of Commons as we speak. Uh, let me quote uh, Labour's Health Minister uh, in Wales. The fact is, our hands are tied by the amount of money that we get from the UK government. That's the situation we are in. How is it that Labour in Wales can recognise that, but Labour in Scotland is so blind to the reality because they're so thrilled to defending the Conservatives at the expense of setting out the reality? In terms of primary care funding, um, of course, uh, the Primary Care Improvement Fund is uh, still increased in value to 170 million pounds. Uh, we have opened the books. The Deputy First Minister has made two statements in this Parliament setting out the savings that we are required to make because of inflation to balance our books. Briefly, uh, so First anybody Minister. who wants to say we should be doing that differently can come forward and say that. What they cannot do is deny the reality. But even within that reality, uh, we have proportionately higher funding for our National Health Service in Scotland than in other parts of the UK, including in Wales, where Labour is in government, and higher staffing levels. That's the measure of the priority this government gives to the National Health Service and always will give to our National Health Service. Thank you. I intend taking general and supplementary questions after question six. And can I ask those members who have pressed for a supplementary, please don't repress. However, if you do want a supplementary that refers to questions four to six on the paper, please press at the relevant point. I call Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Uh, Tuesday. Alex Cole Hamilton. I am very grateful for that reply. Presiding Officer, we see the cost of Conservative incompetence measured out in the Budget today. It will be punishing for families and public services alike. And those on the lowest incomes are most exposed. That includes many working in our social care sector. But the First Minister is asking all of them to wait four years for the wrong solution. Organisations are now lining up to condemn the creation of the deceptively named National Care Service. And this week, Bernardo's were the latest to warn that the huge spend required risks diverting resources away from frontline services. Presiding officer, they are right. The cost of this vast and unnecessary bureaucracy is up to £1.3 billion already and rising. And that's before Scottish ministers trigger a massive VAT bill through centralisation. If the First Minister has a billion pounds to spare, then every care worker in Scotland can think of better ways to spend it. So can I ask her, will she withdraw the bill today and put that money into services and staff? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, Alex Cole Hamilton, as is his right, has opposed the National Care Service uh, from even before the parliamentary scrutiny began. So that is his position. Uh, but he shouldn't stand up here and say it's because of comments that have been made in the course of, of the parliamentary scrutiny so far. We will listen, are listening carefully to that, and it's important that we allow that process of scrutiny to continue. The National Care Service, of course, is about ending uh, a postcode lottery in adult social care that all of us, I think, accept is not acceptable. Um, and it is about better valuing those who work in our social care uh, system. So uh, that's what we want to do. And of course, we will listen to the comments that are made in the course of the parliamentary scrutiny of the bill. In the meantime, of course, we will continue to take action to address the challenges in social care. So we've committed to increase spend in social care by 25% by the end of the Parliament. And of course, we are increasing uh, the wages of those who work in social care. So we'll continue to take that action as we will continue to progress uh, the bill through Parliament, listening carefully to the comments that are made along the way. Question number four, Kenneth Gibson. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government anticipates the impact will be in Scotland of today's autumn statement. 
First Minister. Well, the Chancellor uh, had only really begun uh, the detail of his statement when I left the office to come to the Chamber, so I have not yet uh, had the opportunity to see all of the detail. We will uh, assess the impact of that fully. However, I think it is clear from what we know, indeed from uh, what the Chancellor had indicated before getting to his feet today, uh, that the UK Government is repeating the mistakes of the past. Austerity, uh, which they appear to be reintroducing, does not work and will have significant consequences consequences for people, for businesses and for public services. Uh, these plans are likely to worsen the extreme pressures already been faced as a result of inflation and rising interest rates. We have called for an alternative approach that avoids prolonging uh, a recession that the Bank of England forecasts and the OBR confirms uh, today as I understand it that the UK is currently in a uh, recession um, and I hope that that alternative approach is listened to. Uh, but of course the UK is almost unique uh, amongst wealthier countries in reintroducing austerity. It's the wrong approach and it will have a significant adverse impact on people and public services across Scotland. Yeah. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the First Minister for that reply. On the morning of the last disastrous Tory budget, former Bank of England Governor Mark Carney told the Financial Times that in 2016 the British economy was 90% the size of Germany. It's now less than 70%. Following that budget, £65,000 million, almost £1,000 for every person in the UK, was needed to stop a pensions fund collapse. Does the First Minister agree that the economic incompetence of successive UK governments is why household incomes have languished since 2008, failing to keep pace with inflation as we face swinging cuts to public spending amidst rising taxes? taxes? And, could, and, could, and can she advise us of the alternative to UK stagnation that will deliver a more prosperous, equal and fairer Scotland? First Minister. Uh, well, Kenny Gibson is absolutely right to talk about the impact of Tory mismanagement. What we are hearing from the Chancellor today are tax rises and spending cuts. More than half of the black hole, according to the Chancellor, is going to be filled by spending cuts uh, that will have a, a significant impact on our public services, including uh, the National Health Service. Uh, we, will also, we also know uh, that while there are global factors uh, at play, much of this is caused by UK-specific factors. Uh, Brexit is a long-term and permanent drag on the UK Economy. The effects of that are catastrophic. And of course, Tory mismanagement uh, through the mini budget that I know the Scottish Conservatives now like to pretend never happened uh, are exacerbating that impact. And it's people, businesses, and public services who are paying the price of all of that. And finally, Presiding Officer, yes, there is an alternative to Tory mismanagement of our economy. It's self management of our economy, otherwise known as independence. Michelle Thompson. As the FM, FM's pointed out, research has proven that far from working the UK government austerity programme after the 2008 financial crisis resulted in one of the lengthiest and slowest recoveries. Yet the UK government seemed determined to repeat the same mistakes. So does the FM agree that, given the economic evidence proves that smaller independent states recovered best, it's actually the only sensible choice to follow their path and gain full control of our economy? First Minister. Absolutely. What, what we are experiencing right now is what happens when we allow others to take decisions for us instead of taking these decisions for ourselves. No matter how the Tories try to dress up today's statement, all of the spin that they will use, what they are doing is reintroducing austerity and they are doing that at a time when our public services haven't yet properly recovered from the last period of Tory austerity. That is the reality um, and there is no denying that uh, by the Conservatives and countries uh, across the world uh, of course go through difficult times and some of these issues are global uh, but most countries do better when they control their own destinies and their own future and that too will be true when Scotland does become independent. Question number five, Pam Gossel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government supports the introduction of a domestic abuse register. First Minister. I am aware of the consultation on a proposed domestic abuse uh, bill and certainly take the opportunity to confirm that we will uh, consider any proposals that would further our commitment uh, to do more uh, to support victims of domestic abuse. Um, and, of course, we will consider that when the consultation has 
concluded. It will be important, of course, to look at how any proposals would interlink with implementation of Equally Safe, uh, our strategy for preventing and eradicating violence against women and girls. But certainly we are open-minded uh, to any reasonable proposals that come forward. Pam Gosell. I thank the First Minister for that response. The consultation for my bill, which would introduce a domestic abuse register, closes on Monday. That bill proposal would help to protect victims of this appalling crime. Here is an example. I have spoken to one woman who told me she suffered numerous acts of violence and awful physical abuse for years. Her abuser has allegedly attacked five other women. She believes my proposed bill could have prevented some of those women from going through a horrific ordeal. Will the First Minister agree to meet with me and this brave woman to hear why a domestic abuse register is necessary? First Minister. Uh, of course, we will listen and, and meet uh, when appropriate with anybody who wants to uh, put forward uh, these suggestions. And I absolutely understand why somebody in that situation uh, would consider that a proposal like this would make a difference. Uh, the Justice Secretary, of course, did meet uh, with Pam Gozo, uh, I believe, at the end of August to discuss the launch of the consultation on her proposed domestic abuse bill. And we will uh, consider these proposals when the consultation has closed, which I know it does shortly. And uh, the, the proposals in that consultation have been properly analysed. So we are open minded uh, to that. Of course, the disclosure scheme for uh, domestic abuse, uh, the Police Scotland disclosure scheme is uh, in place right now that has an important impact but none of us absolutely none of us should be complacent about domestic abuse or the need to do more to protect victims and potential victims of domestic abuse so I hope the member uh, will take these comments uh, in the spirit that they are intended uh, they are intended to signify a genuinely open mind we have a number of initiatives in place uh, many of them under the ambit of equally safe that are about protecting women and girls so we need to consider carefully uh, any proposals to ensure that they fit with that but our minds are open and uh, we will have further discussions as appropriate Pauline McNeill Almost 80% of women prisoners in Scotland have a history of significant head injury, but mostly through domestic abuse. And the University of Glasgow has shown that in research, 66% of female inmates have suffered repeat head injuries and for many years. 89% of participants said domestic violence was the most common cause. And it's concerning that many might return to their abusers on release from prison. So can I ask the First Minister what further action the Scottish Government can take to consider that specific point about female prisoners who had a history of being victims of domestic abuse while they're in prison, but importantly when they're released from prison? First Minister. I'm certainly happy to give further consideration to that point and to look carefully at the research uh, that underpins Polly McNeill's uh, question. Um, I think it is the case and it, I think it is also well understood uh, that many women who are in prison will be the victims of abuse um, and will be vulnerable in many respects. Uh, there are uh, similar vulnerabilities, of course, for uh, many men who are in prison as well, but uh, we're rightly focusing on the issue of uh, women right now. The numbers of women in prison has reduced uh, over uh, recent years, of course, um, and we want to see that trend continue uh, so that uh, those who do offend uh, are treated appropriately. Um, but the points about the support for women who have suffered domestic abuse while they are in prison but also upon the release from prison is important so we will certainly and I undertake to give the points that Pauline McNeill has raised today at uh, proper consideration and come back to her when we've had the opportunity to do so. Question number six, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the, government, what the Scottish Government's response is to the report Health Inequalities in Scotland by the Fraser of Allender Institute. First Minister. Well, the report confirms what I suspect uh, most of us already know uh, is that socio-economic inequalities drive wider inequalities and that is exactly why this government is using the powers and resources that we have uh, to tackle that uh, within the limits of course that we operate within. We're doing that in a range of ways, uh, for example through social security including the Scottish child payment, uh, through provision of free childcare, free school meals, concessionary travel, uh, free prescriptions and investment in affordable housing. Uh, but we are doing that and this is just a statement of fact. We are doing that with one hand 
tied behind our backs without the full powers uh, to tackle poverty and while we are shackled to a Westminster system and Tory government uh, which has caused economic chaos and savage uh, reductions in real terms in our budget. So I hope today we hear something different uh, from the Chancellor but as I've said earlier on I fear that the continued or reintroduced austerity that we're hearing today uh, will deepen these impacts uh, but also strengthen the case for more of these decisions and more of these powers lying in the hands of this Parliament. Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you. This week's report confirmed that almost half of Scotland's personal wealth is owned by just 10% of households and that there is a direct link between extreme wealth inequality and health inequality. So does the First Minister accept that the Scottish Government has the power to redistribute land ownership and wealth but has not used that power? That the Scottish Government has the power to abolish the regressive council tax, introduce a land value tax, make land and building transaction taxes much more progressive but has failed to do so? That a wealth tax set and administered by the Scottish Parliament through an order of council could be pursued but she has decided not to. When will the First Minister use the tax powers that the Scottish Government has got to reduce Scotland's extreme inequalities of wealth and to fund our public services properly and progressively? First Minister. Um, I agree with a lot of uh, what Richard Leonard has said there. I suspect I agree with more of it than Anna Sarwar, whose face was pretty impassive as Richard Leonard was uh, recounting all of these policies, which I suspect are not Scottish Labour uh, policies. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, with the very limited uh, tax, if, if it is Scottish Labour's policy to replace the council tax with a land value tax, and I'll be happy to hear that and uh, hear the detail of that. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, with our limited tax powers, of course, uh, we do have a more progressive system of tax. So income tax, which is our main tax power, far too limited uh, in terms of the overall sweep of tax powers, then if uh, you earn more in Scotland, you pay slightly more. And if you earn at least, then you pay uh, slightly less tax than you would elsewhere in the UK. If Richard Leonard wants us to be able to consider and introduce a wealth tax, then he really needs to argue for the powers uh, to lie in this Parliament to do exactly that. So we will always favour progressive taxation, but we need more powers over taxation in this Parliament to give effect to that. Uh, what we have done this week, of course, is both increase the value of and extend the reach of the unique Scottish child payment, yes. putting money directly uh, into the pockets of those at the lowest end of the income uh, spectrum and lifting children out of poverty, a shining example of how we can use powers when we have powers in the hands of this Parliament. Thank you. We move to supplementary questions and I call Stephanie Callaghan to be followed by Miles Briggs. President officer, as the First Minister has just mentioned, the Scottish Child Payment has been increased to £25 and extended to under-16s under this week. And this has been described as a watershed moment by anti-poverty campaigners. But does the First Minister share my frustration that while this Scottish Government is using the limited powers it has to support people, these efforts are frequently undermined by the actions of the UK Tory Government? First Minister. Uh, yes, uh, that's not just a matter of opinion. That is a matter of fact. Uh, so while uh, we are putting £25 uh, now a week uh, into the pockets of the lowest income families per child. Uh, the Tory government in power right now, not that long ago, took £20 a week away uh, from the poorest through the clawback of the universal credit uplift. So that is just a fact. But we will continue to act to use the powers we have. This week was a watershed uh, moment. Uh, the Scottish child payment, uh, that payment doesn't exist anywhere else in the UK and it is an example uh, of what can be done when we prioritise lifting children out of poverty and investing in their future. And as poverty, anti-poverty campaigners have said this week, if the Scottish Government can do that, then why on earth can't the UK Government follow suit? Call Miles Briggs to be followed by Paul Keane. Thank you, President Officer. In the early hours of Monday morning, a war memorial in front of Edinburgh City Council was vandalised in what was a mindless act of vandalism and absolutely appalling insult towards our fallen war heroes. This has both shocked and angered the local community here in Edinburgh 
and I hope those who are responsible will be held to account in due course. But sadly, these attacks on war memorials are increasing in Scotland. That's why my Scottish Conservative colleague, Megan Gallagher, is bringing forward a bill to impose tougher penalties on those who attack and deface war memorials. So can I ask the First Minister if she will agree to consider Scottish Conservative proposals around this issue and what update can she provide with regards to the investigation around Monday's incident? First Minister. Well, firstly, yes, we will consider any proposals that are brought forward. Uh, I have not seen the detail of those proposals yet, but uh, when they uh, do appear, we will give them due consideration and uh, that is uh, certainly important to do. Um, in terms of uh, the attack on the war memorial in Edinburgh, uh, less than 24 hours before uh, that despicable attack took place, I, amongst others, was privileged uh, to lay a wreath uh, at that war memorial in uh, remembrance uh, of those who had made the ultimate sacrifice in the service uh, of their country and to allow us to enjoy the freedoms uh, that we take for granted today. Uh, what happened uh, in the early hours of Monday morning uh, is almost beyond uh, words. Absolutely despicable, sickening and disgusting. It, it is beyond my comprehension. I'm sure it is beyond the comprehension of any of us in this chamber how anybody uh, could attack a war memorial at any time uh, of the year, uh, but particularly just hours uh, after Remembrance Sunday. It would not be appropriate for me to comment on an ongoing police investigation. Obviously, that is for the police to take forward. Uh, but where uh, I will end uh, these remarks uh, in agreement uh, with the member is that I really do hope uh, that those responsible for this despicable attack are identified and face the full force of justice. Thank you. I call Paul O'Kane. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On Sunday, international teams will begin to compete for the biggest prize in world football, but they will do so in a state that denies the rights of LGBT plus people, suppresses the rights of women, and has demonstrated quite clearly that it has no regard for the lives or well-being of migrant workers. Only a few weeks ago, Qatar's World Cup ambassador branded being gay as damage in the mind. Senior figures of the SFA will be attending World Cup events on the day the tournament kicks off. LGBT plus people, many of whom are passionate football fans, are allies in stands across the country, the Tartan Army, the STUC and Xander Murray of Gallifrey Dean Rovers, of whom I think we should all be immensely proud, have voiced concern and disapproval about this World Cup and have called on the SFA to think again. The SFA has said that it is, and I quote, supportive of all measures to improve human rights conditions in Qatar. But does the First Minister believe that our football governing body attending this World Cup can send any other message than a validation of the human rights record of Qatar? And what message does she think it sends, particularly to LGBT plus people in Scotland? First Minister. Firstly, as the, the World Cup uh, gets underway later this week in Qatar, I think it is a really important moment for all of us, regardless of party, uh, regardless of anything else that might divide us, to stand in solidarity with the LGBT plus community in Scotland, in the UK, in Europe and right across the world. Um, and I hope that will unite all of us today. In terms of attendance or otherwise uh, of SFA officials, that is a matter for the SFA. Uh, governments uh, should not uh, intervene in decisions that governing sports governing bodies take, but I would certainly hope that anybody attending the World Cup in Qatar in any capacity uh, would take the opportunity to express uh, solidarity with our LGBT plus uh, community. Um, I think that is what is even more important uh, over the next few weeks than sport, that we take the opportunity to stand up uh, for human rights uh, and the dignity of those in that community and that we unite uh, around that sentiment today and right throughout uh, the period of the competition in Qatar. Natalie Don to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Figures published this week show that the number of young Scots aged 18 to 24 sanctioned by the DWP has nearly doubled since 2019. That's over 2,500 young people being denied vital support in the midst of a cost of living crisis. Does the First Minister share my view that this is immoral and that the welfare system should be there to support people, not penalise them? First Minister. Yes, I, I think Natalie Dawn is absolutely right to raise this issue. These figures are really alarming. Uh, they are DWP figures and they show that the universal credit sanction rate is more than double the pre-pandemic level with over 40 
2,000 sanctions being applied across all claims in July uh, this year. The data also shows that sanctions are applied most to young people between the ages of 18 to 24. Now, despite substantial evidence showing that sanctions simply do not work and that they have long-term detrimental effects, this UK government's sanctions policy is pushing more people into hardship and doing that during a cost-of-living crisis. So I take the opportunity today to call on the UK government to urgently review its sanctions policy, along with the other punitive policies within the universal credit system, such as the five-week wait, the two-child limit, the benefit cap, and focus instead on supporting people rather than punishing uh, them when they are already struggling so much. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, you are aware of the difficulties that are facing the Fourth Valley Hospital. With five consultants leaving in the space of two weeks and the facility being described as a war zone and toxic environment, the Health Board say that any concerns raised by clinical or other staff groups are taken seriously and there is no attempt to cover up. But the reality is I continue to have to make representation to the Board as further whistleblowers come forward seeking assistance. They are saying that the culture within the hospital regarding bullying continues and there is no meaningful change by the senior management. First Minister, this is frankly a shocking situation to occur in any hospital. So what action can we put in place to ensure that the facility is safe and fit for purpose? First Minister. Well, the safety of any hospital is of paramount importance. Let me make uh, two points. And I know the Health Secretary is engaged uh, fully on these issues. Uh, firstly, when a whistleblower raises a concern, that must be treated with the utmost seriousness and thoroughly investigated. But secondly, uh, the Chief Operating Officer of NHS Scotland has met uh, with the Fourth Valley Chief Executive to discuss the concerns raised. The Scottish Government is supporting Fourth Valley uh, to develop uh, a robust, cohesive action plan for improvement. A National Planning and Performance Oversight Group uh, met earlier this month to discuss uh, next steps. And I know uh, the Health Secretary will continue to keep members updated. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. Point of, Point of order, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. President officer, on Tuesday, the 15th of November, I asked. Can I have a, uh, President officer, Tuesday, the 15th of November, I asked Minister Lorna Slater, quote, "When did ministers first become aware that they were using a figure that, to quote Scottish government officials, hadn't been properly sourced?" She responded, quote, "Ministers became aware of the issue on Tuesday, the 8th of November." Emails in the public domain reveal that civil servants actually wrote to at least two ministers in October 2020, really? saying, quote, the 25% estimate has never, to my knowledge, been properly sourced. So the information provided to Parliament by Minister Slater two days ago does not apparently accord with the facts. Parliament has been misled again. On Tuesday, presiding officer, I also quoted the ministerial code at section 1.3c on how ministers who mislead parliament should respond. To the best of my knowledge, the only correction to the record has been by the first minister after I called her out on her previous use of misleading energy consumption statistics. None of those who misled parliament on the 25% claim have apparently acted. Presiding officer, this is a government which appears to hold the ministerial code and the honour and privilege of office in utter disdain. The implications of ministers consistently and brazenly misleading this parliament are huge, as are the implications of ministers not acting in accordance with the ministerial code having done so. Presiding officer, I am concerned that a perceived lack of integrity by Scottish ministers in not abiding by our processes and codes risks bringing this parliament into disrepute and risks undermining your position as presiding officer. Is there any way, therefore, that you can preserve the trust placed in us in this Parliament by ensuring government ministers abide by all aspects of the ministerial code, particularly section 1.3c?
Thank you. The member will be aware that the ministerial code is a matter for the Scottish Government, but it is clearly of paramount importance that members, including ministers, give accurate and truthful information to the Parliament, correcting any inadvertent error at the earliest opportunity. Now, this Chamber, I believe, is fully aware that the Parliament has a corrections procedure, and members will be aware how that works. Um, the current mechanism that is available um, to me through standing orders reflects the procedures and practices that have been agreed by the Parliament itself. And if there is a view that these should be revisited, this matter should be raised with the SPPA committee. That concludes. Um, point of order, Alex Cole Hamilton. Yeah. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I seek your guidance on the procedures surrounding the correcting of the official report after what we've just heard. Because what we've just heard from Liam Kerr is frankly astonishing. The Energy Minister at the time and the current Trade Minister were informed this statistic of 25% had no basis in 2020. So it's import important that Parliament gets the proper facts. At the same topical uh, question exchange on Tuesday, 15th November, the Minister Lorna Slater said that, and I quote, the figure relating to Scotland having 25% of Europe's offshore wind potential was first set out in a 2010 publication. It is now outdated. The First Minister's spokespeople have also said it was, quote, calculated accurately at the time. But how can the Scottish Government confidently say the figure was correct in 2010 when civil servants told them in 2020 that it had, and I quote, and as Liam Kerr said, never been sourced. Put simply, presiding officer, nobody knows where this figure came from. In truth, this statistic has always been make-believe. So suggest, to suggest that it is outdated would sound to any reasonable person that it had been true at some point. Presiding officer, in an attempt to excuse the original falsehoods, I am concerned that the government are now creating fresh falsehoods to cover their tracks. Can I seek your guidance on what mechanisms exist to correct the record and whether you have been approached by the government on this point that rather being outdated, this statistic was never accurate to begin with? I thank Mr Cole Hamilton for his point of order. I have already ruled on this issue in relation to my response to Liam Kerr. Um, it is the case that the procedures that are in place have previously been agreed by this Parliament. The corrections mechanism exists, and I'm sure members understand what that is. Um, the member has made his points on the record. Thank you. That point of order, Russell Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. On Tuesday, you provided a statement to Parliament in response to a woman being ejected because of the colours of her scarf. You apologised and explained that this had been an error, but we still don't know why this happened to an innocent member of the public. Yeah. So I'd like to ask you, presiding officer, if any form of investigation is being done into this sorry episode. A key question would be, did any members or parliamentary staff order or indeed encourage the security staff to act in this way? I thank Mr Finlay for his point of order. Some of the matters the member raises are not matters for the standing orders and therefore are not matters for me to rule on from the chair. I made my views on this matter very clear in my statement to the chamber on the 15th of November and I would refer the member to the official report of that date. Thank you. We will now move on to member's business. There will be a short suspension to allow those who are doing so to leave the chamber and the gallery.